Hi, my name is Durga Borker, and I'm a member of the first year residency class right now. And I have the privilege of introducing Dr. Deborah Langston today, professor of ophthalmology at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Langston has truly been a pioneer in the field of infectious disease of the anterior segment, particularly herpetic eye disease. But her tradition as a trailblazer started early on in her career. After completing her medical degree at Weill Cornell Medical College in 1965, um, as well as an internship in internal medicine at Columbia, followed by two years of virology research, she went on to be the first female ophthalmology resident and cornea fellow at Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary. For many of us here, it's hard to imagine Mass Eye and Ear without a strong female presence. However, in Dr. Langston's early training and early career, this was the reality. There were times, including the day of her residency interview, that this involved going the extra mile to show that she was deserving, a story she'll tell us more about today. She persevered through this time, however, and went on to become the first woman to be chief of a service when she assumed the role of the director of the cornea service in 1973. Her career of 50 years is full of innumerable accomplishments. In fact, her CV is over 60 pages long and details more than 250 original articles, reports, and book chapters. Some significant milestones in her career involve serving as the chair of the FDA Ophthalmic Drug Advisory Committee, being the first to report on many infectious disease manifestations of the anterior segment, and conducting virology research, which has contributed to the FDA approval of three drugs used for the treatment of blinding corne corneal herpetic eye disease. Of course, she's also received the praise of trainees here at Mass Eye and Ear through innumerable teaching awards. When asked about the impact on their education, residents and fellows have nothing but the highest praise to offer. They note that she's humble despite her many accomplishments and that she always really takes the time for her patients and for her trainees and gets to know them well. I personally have really benefited from being in her clinic and felt fortunate to learn from her clinical wisdom and of course her fantastic sense of humor and the time she spends with her patients. There's no doubt that she'll be missed by all when she retires in just a few short weeks. And with that, I'd like to invite Dr. Langston, our beloved virus queen, to present her remarks. <laughs> Thank you, Borka. <laughs> Actually, my, my code name is Virus Queen on the computer. I don't know how you found it. <laughs> anyway, let me see if I can figure out how to work this. I've been up here several times trying to learn how to advance slides, but we'll give it a shot. Anyway, it really is an honor to be the uh, class of 1970 lecturer and to give my now updated talk from none to one to many. One Woman's Odyssey, Me, in Medicine and a History of the Formerly Charitable, Formerly Charitable, <laughs> Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary. Let's see if we can get it, yes. So, my odyssey in medicine started just two weeks after my birth when my mother first told me that I was going to be a doctor. <laughs> As she was a practicing lawyer, I assumed she knew what she was talking about. And in my senior year of high school, my mother gently informed me that I would be applying to Radcliffe and MIT colleges. Being rather clueless, I hadn't really thought about going to college and had not even shown up for my junior SATs. In any event, I'm rather sure that she filled out the applications because I have no memory of that grueling process. When I was finally accepted to both schools, and after much anguish, my mother selected Radcliffe, <laughs> so, which as you know is now simply called Harvard. And Joan, I do want to apologize to you for not going to MIT, but I would not have lasted. My college years were spent in locked battle with our dubiously assisted, uh, esteemed female academic dean over whether I should go to medical or nursing school. The latter favored by the dean as it was, quote, a more suitable field for young women. Well, we'll see about that. Um, 
needless to say, my mother prevailed. In an era when women were not at all welcome into any profession, including medicine, I somehow managed to get into all four medical schools to which I applied. Well, I should say, my mother and I applied. <laughs> But I also knew it was time to make a break for it in terms of taking over my own life. I headed off to Manhattan to spend the next six years at Cornell and Columbia Medical Schools. I was one of four women in a class of 104, and on my very first day of medical school, I was informed by a male classmate that I had no right to be there. I was taking a place that belonged to a man. Well, he didn't look all that bright, so I dismissed the comment. <laughs> Ultimately, I did graduate at the top of our class, and he barely made it out through the bottom. So, <laughs> so then what? After a medical internship, I realized that I wanted to be a surgeon. So I naively wrote to eight surgical programs in Boston and just as quickly received back eight letters, all saying, we do not take women. No applications were included. What was I thinking that I could get into a surgical program? Enter my mother, left stage, try ophthalmology. It encompasses both surgery and medicine. So with a heavy heart, I wrote to the Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary. And to my amazement, I received a letter from Chairman David Cogan's secretary saying, we have never taken a woman, but she didn't say we don't take women. And within a few days, I received a letter of application. So that was a big surprise, and I didn't know what to do with it. In any event, I filled it out, sent it back, and within two weeks received an invitation to join the other applicants on interview day. So the interview day came, but there was one difference. The other applicants, all of whom were male, had just three 15-minute interviews and could then leave. I, on the other hand, spent eight hours at the infirmary reading path slides and rabbits with Chairman David Cogan. I gave a one-hour lecture on my virology research lab work to the Howe Laboratory. And worst of all, I endured six 20-minute interviews, cum oral examinations, with full-time staff members. So that evening, I went back to New York, discouraged and quite convinced I had not made the grade. Two weeks later, I received a letter of application and acceptance to the Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary as the first woman in the door. And I have often wondered if the fact that David Cogan's mother an ophthalmologist trained at the Women's College of Pennsylvania played a role in his support of my acceptance. Perhaps women could be as good as men. We would just have to see. Of course, unlike the male residents, there was an extra condition on my acceptance. I had to do a two-year pre-residency fellowship, officially in the Howe Lab, but physically at Children's Hospital. I worked with my old mentor, Nobel laureate John Enders, inventor of tissue culture and ultimately the polio vaccine. This suited me just fine. It paid $5,000 a year for five years. The regular residents earned just $3,000. And actually, that doesn't sound as bad as it is. But I was paid by NIH and the men were paid by the infirmary. Well, as you have guessed by now, there was, I'm sorry, there was a very clear-cut history of bias against women training at Harvard or at the medical school. 
the MEEI exemplified this practice. For a total of 184 years, the male bastion managed to remain pure for 90 years until 1914 when World War I forced them to allow a German-trained ophthalmologist, but a woman, Maud Carville, into the clinic as the male staff were progressively called to war. Women physicians had in fact been knocking at the door of the infirmary since 1867 when three students at the New England Hospital for Women and Children requested permission to attend clinics at the infirmary. The matter was turned over to the MEE Board of Managers and the Massage Medical Society, which responded that not only was it inexpedient to admit females to the hospital wards, it was also inexpedient to admit them to the medical schools of the state. Women were not fitted to practice medicine by reason of their sex characteristics. Indeed, only one physician, let me go back to him, Dr. Darby, cost him his professorship at the infirmary and at Harvard Medical School because he allowed three women to sit in the rear row of one of his lectures on ophthalmology. So, in 1971, or 1871, the chair was given to Henry Willard Williams, who steadfastly returned and refused to take care of women. Two years later, the infirmary put its official stamp of approval on such negative behavior toward women when Dr. Edward Clark, president of the Board of Managers, wrote, as justification for refusing women entrance into the field of medicine in general, and ophthalmology in particular, quote, what of that period every month, that period all women knew, that period when nature took its toll of her, and she was not herself mentally, physically, or emotionally. <laughs> To ask a woman to compete while under the influence of the curse of Eve, to compete with a male in any endeavor, was to ask the impossible and to court personal and racial disaster. And indeed, Harvard Medical School and the infirmary remained a citadel for masculinity until World War II, which depleted the male residents and infirmary. infirmary. With great reluctance, the infirmary allowed three women physicians, Drs. Kogan, Johns, and Offenbach, to work in the clinics, but none were accepted to the residency. So, this was the atmosphere that existed upon my arrival at the infirmary as the first female resident, 184 years after the founding of that institution. As there never before had been a woman resident, I of course immediately created a logistical problem. Where would I sleep when I was on call? The on-call quarters themselves were not housed in the infirmary, but in the 180-year-old crumbling Gardner building located behind the hospital. It not only housed the infirmary residents, it housed the animal rooms and several thousand cockroaches. <laughs> you had to be careful where you stepped when getting out of bed. But part of my housing dilemma was solved by partitioning the bedroom in the on-call quarters. But when it came to the bathroom, the best partition they could come up with was to give me two toilets, three sinks, and two of those urinals. <laughs> to make matters worse, the only access to the infirmary from the gardener was an underground tunnel. It goes without saying that I never walked to the hospital when called. I ran because I was never sure who was in those dark and scary halls. On the other hand, and up two flights, was the emergency room. One room, one slit lamp, no nurse after 6 p.m. 
You just did the best you could, and I bent over backwards not to awaken the senior on call. My male counterparts had been appalled when they heard that I would be trained not just as a medical ophthalmologist, but as a surgeon. In those days, we entered the residency every three months, working in teams of two. We rotated through various divisions, such as the previously mentioned one room, one chair, one stretcher, emergency room, and as you can see, it could get pretty rough in there. We worked in glaucoma, neuro-ophthalmology, and ocular motility. Retina was always in the dark, crowded with stretchers, and we often had to stand butt to butt while working, which I didn't mind, actually. Um, so. <laughs> so. Um, and then there was cornea. Cornea. Another one-room service measuring about 15 by 15 feet containing four slit lamps, but fortunately we did have one dolman whom we kept. But the greatest amount of our time was spent in what is now called the Comprehensive Ophthalmology Service. In those days, it was called Clinic One. This great room contained huddled masses of patients in the center, surrounded by double exam stations. At each station was one attending, a uniformed nurse, and one resident. The attending was there in case the resident had a question, but also because it was a rule at the infirmary that if you wanted to belong to the staff of this esteemed hospital, you had to donate. Donate two half days of your work week, and this included Saturdays. So, if you had time in between clinics, you could go down and grab a bite to eat in the hospital cellar, which was the site of the local Greasy Spoon. The hospital, unfortunately at that time, had only 10 sparsely equipped operating rooms, which were shared by attendings and residents alike. All alike like all of us. There was no such thing as an operating microscope. Our surgical training started with removing foreign bodies in the emergency room, progressed by the end of the first year to enucleations and strabismus, and on to intraocular surgery by the second and third years. The vast majority of this being Clinic One's cataract service. After cataract or other major surgery, however, all patients were admitted for an average of five days to inpatient floors, as you see on the left, and they shared rooms as elegant as the one you see on the right. Toward the end of my third year, which is really my fifth, I had absolutely no idea what I was going to do with my training or my life. My husband would be entering a radiology fellowship at the MGH after discharge from the military. But there was no such job ever offered to a woman at the infirmary or any other Boston hospital. Then, miraculously, miraculously, I was actually asked to give a clinical talk on herpes simplex of the eye. And this was probably a result of my pre-residency virology fellowship and the years that I had been running the infirmary's virology research lab, a lab which soon moved to the Scapin's Eye Research Institute, where I conducted research for the next 30 years. The day after my lecture, I received a phone call from Dr. Dolman asking me if I would like to become a cornea fellow after my graduation. On my end, as usual, not one bit of thought process went into my decision to answer with an enthusiastic yes. Upon my graduation, however, I noticed that the number of women in the program once again fell to zero. It stayed that way for 10 years after I had been accepted. So I feared that somehow I had convinced the powers that were to close the doors to women again 
and return to the heady days of the solid male bastion. But as we move through the 1970s, the horrors of the war in Vietnam stirred up a multitude of liberation movements, including that of women. More women were entering medicine, which meant that there would be more pressure to allow them to be trained in ophthalmology. With Dr. Dolman's promotion to departmental chair, I became the first woman head of the cornea service. But more importantly, in 1975, Maida Antigua and Anne Bejart were admitted to the, to the residency, sorry, for my first time. Um, and the percentage of women in training leapt from zero to 11%. Is that free? That's free. I think <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. In addition, the infirmary was changing as well, and we were expanding physically. Because we had no adjacent land, however, the expansion had to be straight up. So the managers built the new infirmary right over the old one in three different phases, over three different years, while we just kept working away inside. We towered over the adjacent MGH, and there was more room for everyone even women. The interior was a drastic and elegant change from the old clinic one. There were actually modern check-in lobbies and waiting areas, semi-private exam rooms, and last but not least, the old inferior, inferior exterior tablet with the word charitable on it was removed, smashed, and hauled away. We were no longer free service. As we passed through the 1980s and 90s, the number of women continued its steady increase. Class photos show them steadily pushing up that percentage of females in what was fast becoming a former male bastion. By the mid-1990s, we reached 11 women out of a total of 25 residents, or 44%. The new, uh, the new century then <laughs> had brought with it the death knell to Dr. Clark's strong and pervasive beliefs that women were too sickly and probably irrational during their delicate period each month. <laughs> Joan never did that. <laughs> So a woman surgeon, Dr. Joan Miller, was named the Henry Willard Williams Professor <laughs> and Chair. <laughs> of the Department of Ophthalmology <laughs> at MEI and Harvard University. This must have been a catastrophic event for whatever was left of the original Henry Willard Williams. <laughs> and it is probably just as well that he, Dr. Clark, and their board of managers never saw this graph, which spans 181 years and depicts the rise of the female bastion at the MEEI. It is self-explanatory illustrating the chiefs who brought us to our present status. Over these 42 years, the percentage of women in the residency program grew from zero to 64%. And since that time to the present, the female to male ratio has reached 70% women and 30% men. My fears in the 1970s that I had done something dreadful to lock the doors again against women finally melted away. But for me, there was only one negative factor. That was one that I had never even thought about until Kathy Colby, while preparing a paper on women in ophthalmology, 
asked me if there were a downside to being the first woman in the program. And it was only then that I realized there is one important negative aspect to being the first in the door of an all-male club. It is a very lonely position to hold. I had and still have no female peer group. My peers were and are all men. Many of them are very close friends, but it's not quite the same as also having a large group of women residents and fellows. It delights me to see them holding showers and baby present and luncheons for each other. So I would just like to close on one important note. Women may have broken through the glass ceilings in many of these fields, but of equal importance are our male counterparts. We learn from them as we hope they learn from us. And we simply wanted to belong to what was once exclusively their world, but which now belongs to us all. Thank you.